Carbon tax is a tax per unit of carbon emissions of fossil fuels, considered by many countries as a policy to deal with the problems of climate change. Carbon tax is calculated on the basis of how much carbon fuel emits. The more carbon emitted, the higher the tax. Instead of imposing government regulations, such as setting a maximum level of pollutants permitted, carbon tax is a market-based policy, which relies on the market to correct negative production externalities. Pollution created by firms due to production activities is an example of negative production externality, or external costs created by producers. When you emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you are polluting the environment. This is a production externality because over the firm's private cost of production, there are additional costs that spill over onto the society. This is because carbon dioxide are a part of a collection of gases that negatively influence the quality of our air and increase the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases can cause weather changes, increase global temperature, which could cause the destruction of ecosystems and losses of biodiversity. In addition, air pollution is a major public health problem with a wide range of health impacts that reduce life expectancy and increase illness, especially respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. If a country has a labor force full of unhealthy workers, the productivity of the country will be lower than with a healthy labor force, because a healthy labor force can generally produce more output than an unhealthy labor force. Therefore, it is very important to maintain a good air quality, because having a labor force with good health combined with high skills and good education is among the most important sources of economic growth. A tax per unit of pollutants, contrasting from a tax per unit of output, is intended to work by creating incentives for the firms to buy fewer polluting resources and switch to less polluting technologies. Imposing a tax to correct the negative production externality. When governments impose a tax on pollution, the optimal policy is to impose a tax that is exactly equal to the external cost. So the MPC curve shifts upward until it overlaps with MSC. The new after-tax equilibrium is given by the intersection of MSC and the demand curve, resulting in the lower optimal quantity of the good Q opt and a higher optimal price P opt. However, as I have mentioned earlier, since the amount of money that is paid varies with the amount of CO2 that is emitted, producers may face the incentive to emit less carbon dioxide. When that happens, MSC curve shifts from MSC1 to MSC2, indicating that the external costs are lower due to the use of less polluting resources. This graph also shows how the optimum quantity of the good produced increases. Tax incidence. Tax incidence is the burden of tax. When governments tax the firms for their carbon dioxide emissions, the firms, in order to earn profits, will have to raise their prices as well. Therefore, the burden of the tax is shared. Let's use Australia, for example. Most of Australia's electricity comes from coal power plants. The firms are greatly affected by the new carbon tax policy. Similarly, the retailers and distributors will also experience increases in costs. As a result, the total cost of the consumer's energy bill will rise because of this tax. So how are carbon emissions measured? Emissions can be measured in different ways depending on the kind of activity that generated the emissions. The most common way to measure emissions from burning fossil fuels is by multiplying the quantity of the fossil fuel used by an emission factor. An emission factor is the measure of the average amount of a specific pollutant that is discharged into the atmosphere. When you burn X quantity of fossil fuels, you get Y amount of carbon dioxide. Therefore, you measure the output of carbon dioxide in terms of how much fossil fuel you used in the process. One of the countries that recently imposed carbon tax is Australia. Even though Australia only generates 1.5% of global carbon dioxide emissions, it has the highest per capita emissions of any developed nation. 
Here is a brief overview of the policy in Australia. It started in July 1st, 2012. It will tax companies that emit more than 25,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Agriculture, forestry, and land are exempted from the tax. Beyond 2015, the intention is that the price of carbon will be set by the market with a deliberate scarcity of credits issued by the government to make companies choose to emit less. Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard has predicted the tax would cut Australia's emissions by 160 million tons within a decade, the equivalent of taking 45 million cars off the road. Just to remind you what the cap and trade scheme is, for the cap and trade scheme, a, a central authority sets a cap on how much a pollutants may be emitted. Emission permits give the firm the right to emit a certain amount of pollutants. The total number of permits issued to all companies cannot exceed the emissions cap, and firms that need to increase their emission permits must buy them from companies that require fewer permits. This means that permit buyers are paying more for polluting more, while permit sellers are being awarded for reducing emissions. Carbon tax has its own advantages and disadvantages. For example, carbon tax are easier to design and implement than the cap and trace scheme as the cap-and-trade scheme involves setting the cap at the right level and distributing the permits. Carbon tax do not offer opportunities for manipulation by the government and interest groups. Carbon tax makes energy price more predictable, since carbon tax fixes the price of carbon emissions. Price pr predictability is important for businesses that need to plan their costs ahead of time. However, unlike the cap-and-trade scheme, Carbon tax cannot tar target a particular level of carbon reduction. During periods of inflation, an upward adjustment will have to be decided by the government. How will this tax affect Australians? In an article called An Impact of the Carbon Tax on the Australian Economy, Results from a CJE Model, a computable general equilibrium model is built to model the impact of carbon tax. They simulated the impact of the carbon tax of $23 per ton and analyzed that in the short run, Australia's real GDP may decline by 0.68%. This is because investments and exports will be reduced and imports will be increased. Consumer prices may rise by 0.75%, and the price of electricity may increase by about 26% as a result of the tax. Nevertheless. It allows Australia to make a substantial cut in its CO2 emissions. The simulation results imply an emission reduction of about 12% in its first year of operation. The tax burden is unequally distributed among different household groups, with low-income households carrying a relatively higher burden. Like many other policies, the Australian carbon tax is hotly debated as well. According to Wayne Swan, Australia's financial minister, quote, Employment continues to grow just as strongly after we put a price on pollution. Our economy will continue to grow solidly while making deep cuts in carbon pollution. However, some critics say that the carbon tax is contributing to the record number of firms going bankrupt with thousands of employees being laid off. While the carbon tax adds around 10% to the price of electricity for most families, the impact on many small businesses and energy-intensive firms can be significantly higher. Australia's largest manufacturing firms ask the government to get rid of the nation's carbon tax as it disadvantages local companies that are attempting to compete on the global market. According to a manufacturer group in Australia, quote, in the absence of similar schemes by major trading partners, Australia's carbon tax places tremendous pressure on Australian manufacturers and inevitably leads to job losses and business closures. In addition, Australia's tourism industry has also been impacted by carbon tax. A study by Tourism Accommodation Australia says the carbon tax will add $115 million in cost to hotel and motels. In an article called Going It Alone Will Not Solve Global Problems by Peter Anderson, he used the sky as an example
to point out that the world is interconnected. If the air is polluted in one country, it will not only affect that country's air quality, but will affect the other country's air qualities as well. So when Julia Gillard, the Prime Minister of Australia, claimed that Australia needed a carbon tax to stop big polluters from polluting our skies, Peter Anderson answers that there is no more our skies. He says that global warming is a global issue. This is why Australia going alone with a carbon tax is a mistake. We not only weaken our economy, but can't make a real impact on global warming. We must play our part, but that part must be in sync with what other nations are doing. So, we can't really conclude whether carbon tax is beneficial or harmful for Australia in terms of economic growth, because different people will have different answers. However, in terms of reduction in emissions, nine months. After the introduction of carbon tax, Australia's emissions of carbon dioxide due to electricity generation have reduced to a 10-year low. Which one is more important, economic growth or the environment? This is something we should all think about. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Good luck on your finals. Bye.